Well, our first speaker uh, this morning is uh, Charles Green, who uh, we're indebted to, I'm particularly indebted to, because he's flown in from America on his way to Europe this morning, this afternoon, to, to fulfill an engagement there. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce you to our first speaker for Congress, Charles Green. Charles. There is so much information I can't cover it in a half hour, but I will tell you this. There are three things that I want you to know before this presentation is over, or when this presentation is over. And that is the true name of Ionia, because she wasn't born with that name. I want you to know exactly how many years she performed magic. Very, very short. And I want you to know what she did after her magical career for years was over. This is Ionia, a very beautiful woman, sister to Constance Elise de Beer. Her real name is Clementine de Beer. She was born in 1888 in Brussels, Belgium. She performed magic for only three years. But what three years they were? 1910, 1911, and 1912. That's it. But her first performance was not involving magic but it was involving the name Ionia. And after she gave up the life of magic, she became a princess. But for most of us, Clementine de Vere is the child of Charles de Vere and Julia Perrault. They are, were British. They were born here in England. Eventually, they went to the continent in the late 1800s. They went to Paris, then they went to Belgium. In Belgium, uh, Charles had a theater. Julia performed as Okita, the name that most magicians know her by. Charles de Vere eventually moves down to Paris. He opens up a magic shop. <coughs> Julia Perrault is Okita. She has several posters, probably about six or so, I believe. Um, and a very well-known performer in the magic world. The family does perform together. Charles and Okita are shown here on this bill in 1885, performing together. The family, de Vere, is quite large. They have eight children. All the children <laughs> were named with names that began with the letter C. Here we have Caroline, Claude, Camille, and Charles. The second four of eight, Constance, Cyril, Claire, and Clementine. Constance is actually Elise de Vere. And she was a very famous person on the Paris stage. If you look her up on Google, she's got maybe hundreds of postcards that were done of her. A very famous person on the uh, continental stage. Clementine is Ionia. The family, as I say, did perform together here. We see in uh, 1893 that Okita, their mother, and Elise and Carolina are performing together. Elise is doing some singing and some songs, and Caroline is actually on uh, a musical instrument. In 1888, December 20th, Clementine de Vere is born in Brussels, on Rue Sabla in Brussels, Belgium. The family is still in Brussels. Then they make a move to Paris in 1892. In 1892, the family is moved to Paris, France. Charles opens up a shop shortly thereafter that on the same block as the Follies Bergère. He's very much involved in the theater, in the production, in the theater world. He is well known among all the greats of magic of the time. Uh, Keller, Chung Ling Su, many, many others would pass through his shop and seek his confidence and knowledge. Uh, in that poster, that is a poster for the you see a little girl over there? Perhaps that was uh, Clementine Vere at the age of four, making that officially or unofficially the first I have a poster. In Paris, in 1904, the circus comes to town. Well, the circus came to town every year, but this is very, very special. This is a special place called the Hippodrome Clichy on the northwest side of Paris. It was the home of the Frank Bostock Circus. This was an amazing amalgamation of different kinds of acts. In this spectacular, there is one that caught young Clementine's eye. And that is a man named Herman Whedon. Herman Whedon was a wild animal tamer. And he worked with lions, tigers, and bears. That's right, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. He went on to marry Clementine de Vere 
on the 5th of May, 1904. They were married in the British Embassy Church in Paris. Now, I've mentioned a lot about Britain and England, but all these people are living in Paris. So one thing that kind of throws the story off if you're researching it is that these people were British. They lived in Paris, but their first language was English. They kept their full association with England. They went to the British church and were fully involved there. That's where their history remained. That's how the story evolves is through the British church and through that connection. Uh, Clementine and Herman away at the ceremony that day uh, are Clementine's parents as well as one of Clementine's brothers. Uh, Cle Clementine is just 15 and a half. Her occupation is listed as spinster. Or 15 and a half. They wed immediately after that, this is May, in June, Herman and Clementine go to New York City. Why? Because he is a trainer of animals. And he's got to work for the French Bostock Circus no matter where they go. And in this case, they're going to Coney Island, New York City. 1904, Frank Bostock goes to Coney Island, Herman Weeding goes to Coney Island, Clementine DeVere goes to New York. Fortunately for her, her sister is in New York City as well. Elise DeVere is in New York City because in 1903, she was brought over by Florence Ziegfeld to star in his production called Red Feather. It was a Broadway show, it only ran for about 60 performances, but Elise remained in New York City for that period of time and was there to greet her sister and his brother-in-law when they arrived. Uh, interesting side note is that Ziegfeld was very surprised that Elise spoke perfect English when she arrived, not a French, uh, a French language speaker at all. Uh, this is the poster for Red Feather. It did only go on for a short period of time. This now brings us to Ionia's first performance. And her first performance as Ionia was not as a magician. Her first act was taught to her by her husband, who was a wild animal trainer. She worked in Lyon, this is the only documented thing that I can find, but it is documented. She worked in Lyon in May of 1910 at the Casino Cursal Theater, doing an act with six bears that were dressed in some kind of costume. So that's her first performance, her first public performance. This is the, one, the first one we know of. From that point, she moves into a magical career. Now, I've got to think, as a father of a new daughter, that I really wouldn't want my daughter running around with six bears and living in the circus. <laughs> Not what I want for my child. So, Charles Devere probably thought, you know, I know a few things about magic. He knew a lot of things about magic. He had great connections to the theater as well as the magic. So he designed a show specifically for her, I believe with the belief of taking her out of that situation and making her life a little better. This is a letter from 1911. This comes from the collection of Egyptian Hall, originally I fell in Berkeley, Tennessee, now resides in Egyptian Hall still uh, under the care of my cave The letterhead gives a lot, the master gives a lot of information about the act of Ionia. It features decor by F. Bull of London. Now the posters you're going to see are all of the known posters of Ionia. You'll see 11 out of 22 of those that were supposedly printed. So you're going to see all 11 that were known. Some have never been seen widely. Uh, costumes were by Landolf of Paris. Uh, music was by Robichon of Paris. He carried six tons of equipment. This was not a light little pocket show. This was not close up magic. This was a big show that had lots of costumes, music, six tons of equipment, approximately nine people. There were 22 <coughs> lithographs by Moody Brothers of Birmingham. Beautiful, <coughs> stunning posters. Uh, half sheets, three sheets. And the question is, are there more? We know of 11. This was the last one that did surface. It went from England to Germany and now resides in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, the question is, more? are there more of these posters? And with posters, here's something very interesting about Ionia posters. You know, the idea is they have to come from somewhere. You know, they just don't pick them up themselves. Uh, so I found this other poster. Do you notice a lot of similarity between the two? Uh, same time period, 1910, a Continental Tire poster. 
And then the Ionia posters that we're all very familiar with on the left-hand side, uh, both using mosaic frames, both having women on pedestals, flowing hair, arms outstretched, um, an outstretched arm breaking the frame into the mosaic. Hmm, what came first, who came first? Who is flattering whom we don't know. But being flattered is a good thing as a performer. And in 1911, Ionia is on the cover of the Sphinx magazine. In this case, the card that is used is the only instance where there is a byline for her as Ionia de Vere. De Vere is spelled with just as one word as opposed to being separated de and Vere. Um, speaking of names, it is interesting in the story, if you're going to research it, is that everyone in the story, her husband, her brothers, uh, her brother-in-law, her sisters, everyone has at least two names and they change names and when they tell their own story, they tell their own story differently many different times. There's actually articles in, in the United States about at least the saying that she was born in Denver and just west of Denver, and of course that, well, that didn't happen at all. She was born in New York. So what happens to the career of Ionia, though? She only performed for three years, 1910, 1911, 1912. Well, in New York City, there's the Follies Brugere Theater. This was the first dinner theater of its time. This was a large operation. There were seats below, in front of the stage. The balconies had tables and service on two different balconies. It was also the first theater to have air conditioning. This was a big deal. They're, they spared no expense. And as such, because they spared no expense, they went out of business. <laughs> they closed October 1911. Well, this little advert from a trade magazine provides us with kind of a Rosetta Stone, at least to me, of figuring out where this story goes next. And this comes from the collection of Peter Scarlett. I'm very grateful for this. Because it says, Ionia is looking for immediate work due to the closing of this theater. So she was going to go to America to do this big production. But the theater closed. She had nowhere to go in the <coughs> production of another the theater was open. So she had to choose another option. This lets us know what she's doing. It's got to pass nine people. It's a whole different show. Uh, but it's still a big show, and she's out of work. So where does she go? Well, she goes to Vienna. She winds up in Vienna in 1912. This is the first time that this has been aired, so to speak, uh, in this kind of format to magicians. This is June 1912. It's uh, an advert from a paper. I just want to point this out, just right there. That is Ionia, known as the uh, Queen or the Princess of Magic. Here's another advert for the following month uh, for July of 1912, and this is for Ionia performing at the Kaiser Garden. So now we've narrowed down to being in Vienna performing magic still as Ionia. But what happens in Vienna? Where does she go from here? Well, in the collection of Eddie Dawes, it is a very famous letter from Charles de Vere, written in 1924. <coughs> to Edmund Younger, another magic dealer. And in there, as a postscript, it's just a postscript, it's just these lines, as an afterthought, Charles de Vere says, my daughter, who was Ionia, was at Moscow when the revolution commenced, all her material pillaged, and she was in cellar of hotel three months. People have interpreted this to mean that she was performing in Moscow and that all of her material were magic materials. That is not the case. She never performed magic in Moscow. She never performed magic after 1912 in Vienna. The reason is this man. She met a prince. And when you have a choice to be a magician or a princess, <laughs> <laughs> well, she met this man, Vladimir Arasabi Chitrin. Now, he's a prince only in name. He really doesn't have any money. He's got a title. But he has no money, he's got no cash. But he seems to, or he must have had enough influence that he does marry um, Clementine. Now, at this point, it gets a little vague because Clementine is still technically married to the Lion Tamer. And they have a son, they had a son named Frank, he was born in 1907. Uh, but she's still married to the Lion Tamer on, on paper, but he's off traveling around the world doing his lion taming training. From documents in Russia, specifically in Kambal, I learned that Clementine and her son Frank go to Tambov 
Russia and buy a house. Now, it's Clementine that buys the house, not the prince. But Clementine actually buys the house. She buys an estate in a very desolate area at the time. And she's there with her son. They actually do a lot of traveling. From the FBI file, <laughs> this story is amazing. <laughs> the film and the way. From FBI files, I learned uh, more about Prince Vladimir Aristovich Chitri. Now, why, the, why are there files about him? Because in the future, he goes on to marry two other millionaires. And in 1944, kind of towards the end of the war, he's in Florida, and he's starting to say things like, well, when Germany wins the war, and I'm keeping notes, and we're going to assassinate President Roosevelt. Well, this gets the attention of the FBI. And a dossier is filed, and the dossier that I was able to find was 70 pages of material about him, about this whole episode. And it's interviews with him, with his son, uh, actually, his adopted son, because he doesn't adopt Frank, but in time's first son from the first marriage. Uh, and there's all this information. And in there, they give history as to what happened during this time period after Vienna. So this is Frank Chitring. He's up there at the top in the center. He was a noted uh, tracks, tracksman, a uh, noted runner. Once again, going back to the British connection, he was schooled here in England in very good private schools including Brighton, and eventually he graduated from Cambridge, and I think he also went to, I think it's Amsbury, as well as a private school. In the FBI files, he does state this, and he was working for the U.S. Army eventually uh, at this time, but he says, a few months prior to World War I, so this would be in you know, 1913 or so, um, I was taken by the prince and my mother to Germany. And this is documented in Welling. They spent quite a bit of time in Germany. Uh, and then they went to Russia, where they were before the war started. So from the sun, we do learn that they did move from Vienna to Germany, Germany then to, to Russia. So what happened in Moscow during that time period besides Lenin coming to power and the world really changing? Well, once again, back to the FBI files. We learned from pr the prince and his notations. Uh, he does say that he worked in Moscow from 1916 until 1918 with the Russian government. Uh, he then fled to, from Russia and came to Paris to work for the Russian government in exile uh, at their embassy. So he leaves Moscow with Frank and with Clementine. They go to Paris, they back to Paris. Uh, this is where they live. They live in Neuilly, uh, pardon my pronunciation of that word, a very exclusive, very, very nice, exclusive area of Paris. And I believe at that time it actually wasn't maybe proper uh, Paris actually connected, but it is now. But this is where they lived, in this building. In 1919, they do marry. Uh, during the 20s, they keep this residence, working for the Russian government, and working for the Russian government, Clementine and the prince come to Washington, D.C. to work at the Russian embassy there. In the later 20s, Clementine winds up taking residence during some of her visits in this apartment building, uh, in Washington, D.C., which happens to be only about 10 blocks from my house. It's a very strange story. Mm -hmm. The last known note that we have of Princess Clementine Aristotle Chitrin, in print, that I can find, is in the New York Times, 1937, February. There's a notation about the retiring French ambassador from Washington, and he is leaving America and going back to France. In his company, in his entourage, listed, the third person listed is Princess Clementine Aristotle Chitri. Now she had to be a person of some influence, of some note to be mentioned to be in the entourage of the retired French ambassador. After she left Magic, she closed that door and never looked back. There are people alive today who met her. They live in England and other places, but they met her. And when I offered them this story, telling them I was looking for information about this magician, they said, who? We don't know. No, no, she never did any magic. They never knew that, that she did magic at all. They knew her as a princess. So in 1946 and 1955, Clementine does return to Paris, to another estate in Paris, a very large estate, once again back in New England. 
A little corner lot. Uh, it's actually a huge estate. It's a very beautiful home. It's very, very large. Which makes me wonder, as I look at these things, how did she get to this point in life? Because she didn't really have a job. For a small period of time, between 1920 and 1932, she did have a tea salon in Paris by the name of Osabu. But that was about it. But that doesn't really afford anyone the lifestyle that she led. Because at 1955, she then moves to uh, saint jean cap <laughs> uh, on the French Riviera and lives there until she passes away in 1973. It's all hard to do on a tea salon salary. So how does she accomplish this magical lifestyle? How does she levitate herself above the place from which she came? Twist in the story. It comes down to Frank J. Gottsall. Now we're going back to 1915. 1950, Frank J. Gottsall is in a business deal with the French government during World War I. He is selling vehicles, not mules, not animals, vehicles, army vehicles to the French government. He gets a commission. The French government feels he does not deserve this commission. He is in the United States at the time. He had, they had him arrested in the United States, in Washington, D.C. He is in jail in Washington, D.C. The court proceedings progress in Washington, D.C., yeah. all the way up to the D.C. Superior Court. A part of this dispute is the amount of the commission, or whether he should get the commission at all, and the amount of money, as reported in the papers of that time, are anywhere from 1.5 million to six million dollars. 1.5 million to six million dollars in 1918. That's a lot of money. You can do almost anything you want at that point. And they do. They have offices in New York City at the Ritz Carlton, that's where they stay on the Ritz of America. They have homes in, um, in Florida. They have a big estate on the lake in uh, Switzerland. And they have other homes in Hollywood. Frank Gossel actually goes on to become the president of Goldwyn Pictures and actually kicks Samuel Goldwyn out of his own company, then goes on to sell Goldwyn Pictures to form, allow the alliance and formation of MGM Metro Goldwyn Mayors. This man was well connected, he had a lot of money. But just like a magician, he vanishes shortly after that time period and is rarely ever heard of again. The story ends, as most of our stories do, at a burial. <coughs> the plot includes several DeVere family members, including Julia Farrar, Rakita, Charles DeVere, and most importantly, Aristotle Chitrin, in French, nay, born as. Devere. Clementine Devere, 1888 to 1973. This is the family tomb in Paris. That's the headstone. That's the side marking with her name engraved there on the stone. This story is much bigger than this. There's more information. It involves a lot of different people, and it involves people who are still alive today who knew Clementine, there are people who definitely knew their son who wanted living in the United States. But there are three things I do want to leave you with, and I hope that you'll carry with you, is that her real name is Clementine DeVere. She was a real living person, a magnificent person. She performed for only three years, three years as a magician, and then eventually she became Princess Aristotle Chichard. If you're doing research, this information will help you greatly. If you find out anything new, please let me know. I, I welcome the chance to learn something new about her. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you specifically for coming.